Now I'm pleased to present tonight's speaker, Noel Poyer. Noel holds a master's degree in history and for 14 years worked for the, in for the Department of Historic Trades at the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, where he researched, presented, and developed public programming focusing on America's early industrial and technological development. His interest in this subject led him to pursue leadership positions at institutions that had the subject matter as their focus, including the Quiet Valley Living Historical Farm and Historic Bethlehem Partnership. He has been the museum director for the National Watch and Clock Association since 2007 and is a member of the board of directors for the Early American Industries Association. Now I'll turn it over to Noel for tonight's presentation. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for uh, spending your Sunday evening with us as we look at this really unique pocket watch, among others. Um, for starters, uh, before I begin, I'd like to thank our sponsors for this webinar, uh, the Vortic Watch Company. Uh, as you know, these webinars are operated through a software called GoToWebinar, uh, which uh, has a cost involved in using it and making it available for free uh, for our membership. And Vortic has been kind enough to underwrite uh, this particular webinar on Luther Goddard, which makes sense, uh, given their strong attachment to American-made pocket watches and preserving and giving them a whole new life. So I'd like to thank Vortic uh, for their sponsorship of the webinar this evening. One of the reasons uh, that I approach this story of Luther Goddard is I approach him from a perspective um, of a historian as opposed to the perspective of a horologist. Um, I think it's important that we look at individuals and where they fit in the larger history of, of uh, industry and of the watchmaking industry and of horology. And what's interesting about Luther Goddard, what attracted me to studying Luther Goddard was how he represents in many ways a bridge between two industrial revolutions. Uh, the industrial revolution that occurs in Great Britain in the early uh, 19th and late 18th centuries and the industrial revolution that is yet to occur in the United States. Uh, in the 19th century, and, and 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 we'll see more about why he's a bridge to that as we as we go along through the slides. Um, I will stress that uh, this is a talk that I typically give um, to crowds of folks who have no interest in watches whatsoever. Um, they are typically more interested in history or in industrial history or technological history. So I focus more on that subject matter, but we'll look a little bit more at the watches as we go through. I've tried to to take out some of the material that might not be relevant for this evening. So as we look at Luther Goddard, for starters, um, you know, who was he? Uh, this is a painting of Luther Goddard that is owned by the Shrewsbury Historical Society in Massachusetts, um, which they were kind enough to provide us uh, images of um, when we created our, our Luther Goddard presentation and panel in the museum. Um, uh, Luther Goddard was born in 1762, uh, February of 1762. Uh, he was the son of Daniel Goddard, and his mother was Mary Willard Goddard. Uh, Mary Willard was of the famous Willard family of Grafton, Massachusetts. Uh, actually, Luther Goddard was actually a cousin uh, of Simon Willard. And while there's no real uh, paper evidence of it, uh, it tends to be believed that, that Luther started his apprenticeship uh, in the shop of Simon Willard. Uh, very early, uh, uh, and I think earlier than what most people would think. Um, typically in colonial America and early 19th century America, apprenticeships tended to start in trades as around 12 or 13 years of age uh, with certain trades like watchmaking and clockmaking, which the physical demands may not be the same as, say, a blacksmith or a carpenter or a, or a timber merchant or a sawyer. Um, they could start even earlier than that, sometimes as early as 11 or 12. So the idea is, is likely that, that Luther Goddard started his apprenticeship in, in the shop of Simon Willard sometime around his 12th or 13th birthday. I'll talk a little bit more later about some of the further research that needs to be done, but that's, that's kind of the assumption I think we have to make when we look at the way apprenticeships functioned in colonial America and in early 19th century America. Um, now, he started his, he finishes in, in typically in Massachusetts fashion and in, in an American apprenticeship fashion. His apprenticeship ended when he became 18. Um, sometimes you'll see them end as late as 21, um, but typically they'll end when you become a majority or, or you reach your age of majority. Uh, 
So 18 or 21 were, were, were the typical ages that you'd see apprenticeships ending. We know that uh, Luther Goddard must have ended his apprenticeship at 18 because by 1780, um, he had already begun his own business um, and carrying on work uh, essentially by himself. But, but it should be stressed that he was doing what a lot of tradespeople in, in colonial America did, particularly those or in early American history did, particularly those who lived in rural areas where he spent the majority of his season of his year farming. Uh, so when it was possible to be farming, Luther Goddard, like all of his neighbors, was farming. Um, when the winter came around and farming wasn't possible, uh, Luther Goddard then went back into his shop and, and began to work on clocks and watches and, and, and those types of objects. So he had a very, you know, fairly straightforward business model at the time, a very typical early uh, American business model you would have seen practiced in the colonial area as well as the early 19th century in America. By 1784, um, Luther Goddard moves to Shrewsbury, Mass. Uh, if any of you have been to Shrewsbury, uh, Shrewsbury, Worcester, Grafton, they're all fairly close together, uh, even, by, even by 19th century standards. In 1784, he, he purchased his farm in Shrewsbury. Um, as I mentioned, he, he basically farms in the, in the farming months, you know, during the seasons when it's possible to farm. And then in the wintertime, uh, he goes into a shop and, and makes some clocks. Um, by 1790 at his farm, he actually erects a one-story hip frame little shop that's 18 feet square, um, which is right attached to his home and has a big lean-to on the back of it that he used for casting uh, the various metals that he needed to cast for the clock-making and watch-making business. Um, his son, Parley, uh, is born in 1787 and Daniel in 96, 1796. Parley, uh, essentially, like his father, is trained in the watchmaking and clockmaking business. Uh, Daniel, while he works with the watches and the clocks with his father and with Parley, uh, actually apprentices uh, with him but does instead essentially silversmithing uh, as an apprenticeship. So, he, so what Luther Goddard is doing, even in the late 1700s, early 1800s, is he's kind of diversifying uh, his shop, which if you look at uh, colonial and uh, early American uh, trade shops, you'll tend to see a great deal of diversification going on um, on a small scale. So not, not on an industrial scale, but on a small scale diversification in the shop so that Luther Goddard would be able to rely on his own shop staff uh, for the work that he needed done when he could do that. Um, there is some evidence, although, again, the paper trail isn't, isn't firm on it, but there is some evidence that his cousin, Nicholas Goddard, who actually went on to be a, a rather well-known clockmaker in Vermont, um, also may have been serving an apprenticeship with him. We'll talk a little bit more about the apprentices as we get on uh, through the talk a little bit, because the apprentices uh, in Luther Goddard's shop actually become very important as part of showing Luther Goddard as a bridge um, between two revolutions. Uh, the dial you see there is a, a clock made from a clock made by Luther Goddard in his Shrewsbury shop. Um, by 1809, he starts calling his business Luther Goddard and Sons, and you will see that name appear on some of his watches. Uh, this is, gives you an example of some of Luther Goddard's work um, as a clockmaker. Uh, what's interesting to me about any of these clocks is, again, with, with further research, we'd probably be able to determine uh, who the cabinet makers were working in the uh, uh, Shrewsbury area who might have been able to make this case for, for Luther Goddard and who this clock was made for. Um, this is a clock that actually sold uh, a few years ago at Delaney Antiques, uh, which is where I stole these pictures from. You may be familiar that, that really, I have watches here, but, but the reality is uh, in early, eight, late 18th century, early 19th century America, Virtually all of our finished products, uh, our, what we consider kind of consumables or consumer products, would have been imported uh, from Europe. And, and, and the vast majority of those products are being imported from Great Britain. Uh, principally, it's because Great Britain has begun its process of industrialization in the late 18th and early 19th centuries already. So they're already uh, producing uh, consumer goods in, in large quantities and, and efficiently. So they become rather affordable. Um, I think it's interesting when you study the American Revolution and the effect the American Revolution has on trade shops. Uh, what you will find is that before the revolution begins, uh, colonial America is importing all of its finished goods from Great Britain. Uh, when the war, end, war begins, uh, they start creating things here to meet the needs of locals, both for the war effort and for individuals. And when the war is over, we go right back to importing things from Great Britain. So. It, there's nothing unusual about about the fact that by the time we're looking at, at, at Goddard working in his shop, that the vast majority of consumer goods um, were actually being imported from Great Britain. And these are a couple of examples of, of 
watches that you may have seen in colonial America, and you will see these. Uh, the English, Swiss, and French were primarily the watches that would be coming in, although the vast majority of them were, were coming from Great Britain. Um, they, they tended to use verge and fusee escapements. You will, you will see other types of escapements on these watches, but they tended to be verge and fusee. Um, by at least during the time of Goddard, and, that, and that's apparently what Goddard worked on and was comfortable with when he started creating his own watches. To give you an idea of uh, you know what these watches are like, and if you're not familiar with them, uh, this is a pocket watch from the museum collection, uh, 17th, 18th century Verge Fusee pocket watch uh, by an English maker. English maker, um, and I'll just run this video for you, and you can watch it. And this is the watch I think that you know would have been very familiar uh, to Luther Goddard, to the apprentices in his shop, um, really familiar to any watchmaker in late 18th and early 19th century America. Um, you know, a, a nice, uh, fairly simple, you know, this has a very uh, decorative uh, balance cock on it. Uh, and you'll see some of that evidence as we look at Luther Goddard's watches as well. Um, but Luther Goddard was kind of working along in his shop in the early 19th century with his sons, uh, basically just trying to make a living as a farmer and as a on a side business clockmaker and watchmaker. Uh, and so, and that's working out fine for him, um, at least initially, uh, until uh, early 1800s when we start to have other issues with Great Britain again, uh, as well as with our, our past French allies. Uh, who have started to fight one another in the Napoleonic Wars. And people are trying, those countries are trying to bring the United States into this conflict. And not surprisingly, the French are eager for us to join on their side. Uh, the English are eager for us not to. Uh, the, the idea, of course, among the Americans is to stay as neutral as possible uh, in this endeavor. Uh, remember, we're a very young country in 1809 and 1807. Uh, we're not really prepared for a major war yet. Uh, and so the goal, essentially, of these early politicians with, with, in relationship to the Napoleonic Wars is to remain neutral. Part of that <laughs> involved uh, embargoing foreign goods, uh, which, which, which you find in the Embargo Act of 1807. Uh, the Non-Intercourse Act of 1809 also began to restrict further goods coming into the United States. Uh, and basically, trade with Great Britain and France, both, was essentially brought to a ground, basically ground to a halt. Uh, those consumer goods that were coming in on a regular basis from Europe, as well as the raw materials necessary sometimes for, for men like Luther Goddard and other tradespeople to perform their trades, um, were also unable to be received. Um, and so, well, they, they could get them. They got them on the black market, and we, we learn a little bit about that when we, when we study Luther Goddard. Uh, with the War of 1812 beginning, um, what you see is basically it's impossible for the United States and for craftsmen and, and tradespeople in the United States to acquire those goods, and they end up seeing, you start to get to see again in the United States what we were seeing in America during the Revolution, which is a, a, an environment that is really ripe for individuals to begin to manufacture. Uh, and, I, and I really should put manufacturing in quotes because uh, we're, we're not talking industrial revolution manufacturing scale. We're talking about kind of cottage industry shop manufacturing scales. So by 1809, uh, when the Non-Intercourse Act of 1809 starts, um, you, Luther Goddard starts to go in the business of actually making watches. Now, there's something else going on uh, in Luther Goddard's life about that same time. Uh, but we'll, we'll talk about that in a, in a minute. Uh, his workforce, uh, Luther Goddard's workforce by 1809, uh, when he starts actually producing these serialized watches. Um, really, we know some of his apprentices. We know Parley Goddard was his son. Um, we know that Daniel Goddard was also his son who was in his shop working with him. Um, Nicholas Goddard, who, is, who was a cousin, uh, was likely working in his shop. There's so another gentleman named James Harrison. Uh, James Harrison was a gentleman who went on to make watches. I think he made about 80 or so watches himself um, after he finished with, with the Goddards. Uh, there's Jubal Howe. Um, who, if you're familiar with Denison and, and, and that story, you'll, you'll know who Jubal Hal is. He went on to be a rather productive uh, jeweler and watch case maker and, and very prominent Bostonian. And the other one is William H. Keith, uh, who you might be familiar with as well, uh, who went on to the Boston Watch Company, was instrumental in having the Boston Watch Company move uh, from Boston to Waltham, and by the 1860s uh, was president of the American Watch Company. Uh, so, I mean, 
what you're seeing here is are these very interesting kind of interesting dynamic again looking at Luther Goddard as a bridge and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, there were other workmen in his shop as well that we know about um, there's a gentleman by the name of Samuel Howe uh, and Samuel Howe was a local historian and he wrote a, his, a history of Shrewsbury Massachusetts um, in which he talked about Luther Goddard. Luther Goddard's very well known in that area. Um, and, it, and he stated that, that many of the uh, intricate elements and details used in the construction of his watches uh, were Luther's own inventions, but that he was also obliged on many occasions that he had to procure skilled foreign workmen, as there were very few native mechanics, they call them mechanics, uh, who could be found able and knowledgeable enough for the fine work of watchmaking. So we know both from uh, Samuel Howe's records and his story of Luther Goddard, who was uh, essentially Samuel Howe was alive uh, when Luther Goddard was in his late, in, in his very old. Uh, so he had a relationship with him, and, and so he's discussing this idea that there were uh, former British soldiers that were serving in his shop. Uh, there was a local gilder who worked on the gilding for his watches. He had a local engraver that he worked on, although it is possible that given Daniel Goddard's uh, silversmithing uh, skills, he may very well have been doing some of the engraving as well. Um, you will see some crude engraving on some of these pieces, but that's okay. Uh, if we look at his shop, uh, I'm always fascinated by shops, and so I, I tend to spend a lot of time and energy um, looking at, at people's shops. And, and so this is a description from William H. Keith. Uh, you may be familiar, you may not be, uh, with the fact that William H. Keith wrote his story, his own personal memoir of his life, which included a rather significant amount of co information on Luther Goddard and on the shop and on his childhood as an apprentice in Luther Goddard's shop. And I think that when you read this description of uh, Luther Goddard's shop, I think you could you could kind of replace Luther Goddard's name with almost any any tradesman um, in the early 19th century uh, who would have looked at who would have been dealing with these same issues. Um, and also, not surprisingly, uh, as you read through this, uh, I'm not going to read it to you. You can do that. Um, you'll notice they comment on the fact that the steel wire, the main hair springs, the balance if you see chains, they all had to be imported. Uh, oftentimes, they, they, he uses the term war prices. Uh, that's another term for black market, uh, if you look at these records. Um, he also mentions that most of his tools were English, which we, we, we certainly shouldn't be surprised by that at all, um, that uh, particularly in New England, uh, that the majority of the tools being used by tradesmen there are going to be of English origin. Uh, that may not have been the case with clockmakers working here in Pennsylvania or with uh, clockmakers working elsewhere. But certainly in New England, I think English tools would have been the most likely choice anyway. So when you read about his shop, you see he's got a fairly good operation going here. He's got uh, casting being done for the watch parts. He's got finishing being done for the watch parts. Uh, he's got the manufacturing, the, the processing of the watch parts, uh, the actual putting the watch together, the engraving of the watch. The, the, and we'll see some more details of those engravings as we go through and look at the watches. Um, Luther Goddard's watches have a lot of similarities. Um, one of the jobs that I've been working on, one of the things I've been working on with these watches is trying to photo document as many surviving examples of Luther Goddard's watches as I can, both in uh, public hands and private hands. And so I've had a lot of uh, interactions with other museums and with other collectors um, who happen to have Goddard watches. So we can kind of basically develop a baseline uh, for what Luther Goddard's watches tended to, to look like and where they tended to come from and, and what they're, what, how he tended to put them together. Actually, just since this webinar has been promoted, I've had two other NAWCC members reach out to me and provide me photographs of their watches, of their Luther Goddard watches. And so uh, I'm very hopeful that at some point we'll be able to have a complete documentation, at the very least, of all of the surviving uh, Luther Goddard timepieces that are out there. Uh, when I first started this research, the general consensus was there was maybe two dozen of his watches that have survived. Um, I can tell you I've seen a lot of watches already by him, so I'm thinking we might have more than that. Uh, entirely. So I'm hoping to uh, be able to see all of them um, at some point and be able to study all of them. So let's take a look at some watches. Um, the general consensus is made about 530 watches. Um, we don't really know exactly. Um, the numbering system isn't exactly complete. Um, it, it, it isn't terribly consistent uh, in a lot of ways. Um, these are some examples from public collections. Um, you see uh, basically dial examples, and what you're looking at, of course, on most of these watches, and, and it seems to be fairly typical with Luther Goddard watches, uh, is an Arabic dial. 
um, which is fairly straightforward. Um, not terribly, you know, fancy. The cases are, are, are similar in a lot of cases um, when you look at these. Uh, the numbering system, again, is, is, is unusual um, because sometimes they, they don't make a lot of sense where they fall into it, uh, where one watch falls into the numbering system. Uh, what's interesting is uh, the Shrewsbury Historical Society actually has two Luther Goddard watches. So what you're seeing here is the uh, dial and the case of one that they have, and then I'll show you the detail of the movement of the other. Um, that we can look at. But the, again, it begs the question of how many of Luther Goddard's watches have survived uh, and how many have not. Um, because after 1817, Luther Goddard basically stopped making watches. And, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that as I get closer to the end of my little talk. So a couple examples of the movement, uh, the plates and the, and the balance cocks. Um, I, I've tried to include the numbering on here so it gives you an idea of, of what we're looking at uh, in, in the high, and again, whether or not these numbers mean consistently that that's the order in which they were made or there was some other logic to the numbering system, we don't really know yet. Um, you'll notice something commonly, uh, co that commonly appears is that these watches look very English and that should not come again as any surprise. Um, we wear Luther Goddard is working. Um, we know that there were uh, English craftspeople working in his shop. Um, they have an English history and English heritage. Those are the watches they principally would have seen. So it's not terribly surprising that when Luther Goddard began watch production, um, that his watches were going to look uh, and appear very similarly to the English examples that, that I think we're all familiar with. Um, what you will notice as you look at some of these watches, uh, as you look at the dial or the movements, is there's a couple of things that, that kind of jump out at you on the watch number 155 and 51. These are the watches that were in the collection of the Time Museum. Um, you'll notice how kind of crude the script is uh, on the on the plates. Uh, the engra the the pierce work on the balance cock on both of those uh, is still very nice, but but the script is very rough. As you look at the later editions of the watches, uh, if you look at particularly old Sturbridge's watch on the on the far left, number 621, it's a much later version. Um, very elaborate uh, engraving, uh, well, very nice uh, lettering on, on the watches. Uh, most of the watches will say L. Goddard. Um, they'll say Shrewsbury Mass if they've been produced in Shrewsbury, but, but that's not necessarily the case on all of them. They usually will have their number. Uh, in some cases, the watches will actually have who they were made for on them, and I'll show you an example of that um, uh, in a little bit. Uh, what's interesting is if you look at the L uh, in Luther Goddard, um, and if you're not familiar with script writing of the of the 18th and early 19th centuries, uh, sometimes that L is mistaken for a P. So there are watches uh, that I think occasionally are attributed to Parley Goddard, which very well may be Luther Goddard watches um, because of folks uh, misinterpreting the L for a P. Um, but uh, it's it's fairly when you when you look at enough 18th and early 19th century script L's, um, you tend to know what you're looking at. Um, these are all uh, L. Goddard's, but again, if you look at the signatures on the Time Museum pieces versus the old Sturbridge versus uh, our number 497, um, which is one of the, one of our Goddard pocket watches that we have, and even on the uh, Shrewsbury Historical Society number 458, um, you'll see that the, the uh, script is much more refined. You'll also notice uh, the motif that appears on both uh, the one Time Museum and then also on the old Sturbridge Village is the eagle. Um, and the eagle is a very common feature that shows up uh, on the Luther Goddard timepieces. And I guess we shouldn't be terribly surprised by that since Luther Goddard is producing these watches at a time in which uh, America is essentially at war both economically and then later physically. Uh, and so the creation of these watches with, uh, with patriotic motifs should not be terribly surprising. Um, as we look at our watch, and we, we'll look at another example uh, later as well, there may also have been other reasons for that, and we'll get into that as well. So this is our watch. We call this number 462, uh, which is the number on it. First thing you probably notice is the dial. Um, uh, I was lucky enough to sit down and go through this, uh, or go over this watch uh, with a fine-tooth comb with uh, NAWCC member Phil Ponitz. And, and we really just went right into everything about this watch and, and took the dial off and really looked at everything very up, very closely. Um, there's little question that the dial is a replacement dial on this watch for, for a couple of reasons which don't really be relevant. But what's important about this watch is really the hands. And the hands are important because we know that uh, 
one of the things that Luther Goddard was, uh, besides being a farmer, besides being a watchmaker, besides being a clockmaker, was he was an early converter to the Baptist church. Um, and he became a lay preacher in the Baptist church. He did the circuit around the Massachusetts area. Uh, he became very devout uh, Baptist, became an elder in the church. Uh, he opened a church in Shrewsbury. Uh, so he was very, very active in the church. There are stories that when Luther Goddard would go to preach at a church, um, he, people would bring their watches to the church and he would work on them after the sermon. And then if he could fix them, he'd give them right back to them. So it was pretty apparent that, and it shouldn't be surprising that in these original hands on this particular watch, what you, you see that, that cross feature uh, on the hands. I'm going to try to see if you can see my mouse move here, but just kind of highlighting this, this kind of religious motif, um, which made these hands particularly... Um, very unique. I haven't seen hands like this on a Goddard, on any other Goddard watch. Um, and this watch particularly is, is special for a lot of reasons. Um, let's take a look at the inside or at the movement. Here are the plates. Um, again, you're going to see that Luther, Goddard, and Son, which he, he starts using about 1809, even though his sons by 1809 probably aren't working in the shop, but he goes, he goes ahead and use that anyway. Uh, number 462, and it says Shrewsbury here. <clears throat> again, you're seeing that eagle. We're going to zoom in on these, on these elements so you can get a better look at them. Um, but again, very decorative, uh, balance cock, uh, you know, typical Bosley regulator, nothing, you know, nothing unusual. I mean, you, if you didn't know this was a Luther Goddard watch, you might think this was an, a, was an English watch. As we zoom in a little bit on the balance cock, you start to see, uh, some incredible detail that went into this, um, into the balance cock. Uh, you see the arrows, uh, the eagle, um, the florets along the piece here, these little details, uh, the flags. I'm going to zoom in here and talk a little bit about this. So um, as we get into this section of it, um, there's a lot of, uh, of iconography here that leads us to believe that this watch was made for someone pretty special um, and was made likely for a veteran of the American Revolution. And, and the reason for that um, are a couple of things uh, because there are certain details here that you don't see in later motifs. These little features that you see here, um, if you can see them, um, are actually liberty caps, um, which were commonly worn among the militia in Massachusetts during the Revolutionary War. We've got a snake here, which again is very typical of, of a Revolutionary War motif. Then of course we have the eagle, um, we have the flags that are that are here, very straightforward. So I sent this image um, to a few folks of mine who are, uh, one is the director of the new American Museum of the American Revolution, who was a friend of mine and I've worked with for years when I was at Colonial Williamsburg and told him, look at this and tell me what you see. And, and he saw exactly the same thing. Um, and he saw those same motifs. They jumped out at him just as they jumped out at me when I first saw them. Um, so as we look at this, we're, we're not talking about a watch that was made uh, made for just your average customer. This was made for somebody probably pretty important. If we go down a little farther on the balance cock, um, we also see uh, an arm you know, holding a sword. Uh, we also see uh, what might be waves. Um, we haven't really determined what these features are supposed to represent. So is it possible that this, this was a watch produced for, for a naval, a gentleman who served in the Navy? Uh, during the American Revolution? Could it possibly be a soldier during the American Revolution or an officer? Um, all of those things are options, I think. Um, and as we look at all of these features, I'm going to go back one again. As we look at all of these features that show up on this balance cock, on this very decorative balance cock, um, it's really hard to look at this watch and, and not see that it was made for someone who had a very close and important connection uh, with the founding of the Republic, with the American Revolution. And so it, it makes this watch uh, important, again, for those reasons as well. The other thing that's interesting about this watch, and this is something that, that Phil and Ponitz and I went over a lot, is the case. Now, remember, um, we know that uh, Daniel Goddard was learning silversmithing um, as an apprentice in the shop, that he was learning engraving, that he was learning that trade. And, and Daniel Goddard goes on, uh, to be a rather accomplished silversmith himself uh, in the Worcester, Massachusetts area. I'll show you an example of his work a little later. Um, a very well-known, actually, uh, silversmith. 
So the idea of making the cases isn't terribly unusual, but one of the things that we get that kind of gave us uh, as we looked at this watch and we wanted to determine whether this case was made in, in this country or made uh, in Britain uh, was we, we really looked at things like the hinge, the hinges on the watch. Uh, if you look at these hinges and that's why we kind of blew it up, um, you can see there's, there's fairly good gaps in these um, showing, and there's a little bit, a lot of play in that hinge. There's no other evidence on this watch that it was heavily used. I mean, it's in, it's in pristine condition. So the assumption we've made is that, is that these hinges um, were always a little bit loose. They were never really, really tight. Um, when we looked at, we pulled out English watches and English cases from the same period here in the museum, the collection, and that's one of the beautiful advantages of working at the National Watch and Clock Museum. And we pulled out a representative sampling of them and, and looked at the hinges very closely, up like we did with this one. And what we discovered is that those hinges that were being produced in Great Britain were produced with tolerances that were much better than this. Uh, a much tighter fit, a much better hinge, a, a much cleaner joint, which led us to believe that this case is likely made in the shop, uh, in, Daniel, in Luther Goddard's shop, uh, for this watch. Further evidence of that uh, you can see if, if you look at the pair inside of the pair case um, where you see the eagle uh, hallmark. Now, going through all of our hallmarks uh, that we've gone through here in the library and the archive, trying to find this hallmark, uh, what we discovered is while we found hallmarks that are similar to this one, um, this hallmark is unique to this watch. We, we haven't seen this hallmark um, on any other piece or in any other uh, listing of hallmarks. And you can send me pictures of hallmarks that look kind of like this, and I trust you, I've seen them, but but none of them look exactly like this hallmark. The closest one we came to was a, was a silversmith in, in New York City, um, which would make that would be unusual for, for Luther Goddard to have done that. And so again, we're, we're working with the assumption with this watch that it was all produced, the case, um, and, and the watch parts and, and the movement dial, or not the dial, but the, the various parts were, were actually produced in Luther Goddard's shop as part of this manufacturing process. So what do we need to know more about Luther Goddard? Well, oh, I should back up. Remember I mentioned Daniel Goddard. <laughs> uh, he went on to do a, a rather successful uh, silversmithing operation in Worcester, Massachusetts. Uh, and this is a spoon of Dan that Daniel came out of Daniel Goddard's shop about 1820. Uh, long after Luther Goddard had stopped making watches and the Goddard, Luther Goddard and Son had stopped actually production of watches. And they were really just going into jewelry and, and silversmithing as their main line of work. Uh, this is a Daniel Goddard spoon that I purchased on eBay. Um, I couldn't help myself. Um, and you will see other versions of Daniel Goddard spoons on, on eBay as well. You'll also see spoons that are Mark Luther Goddard, but don't be confused. Um, that is a, 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 a generation it's Daniel Goddard's son. Uh, Luther Goddard went on to be a silversmith as well. Um, and you will find Luther Goddard Mark Spoons, but those are actually not our Luther Goddard. They're Daniel Goddard's son. But again, giving you the, 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 letting you know that you, they have the silversmithing ability and they were able to produce those things on their own. So what's left uh, to do? I, I think that as we look at Luther Goddard, remember I mentioned him as a bridge. Um, and he's a bridge because what you see going on in Great Britain, uh, the Industrial Revolution in Great Britain that's occurring, uh, Luther Goddard is duplicating that on a microscopic scale in his shop. Um, he's diversifying his labor force. He's, mass, he's, he's essentially doing the best mass production one can do in a small American shop in, in the early 1800s. And so he must have had his shop organized very well, uh, certainly in a way that, that uh, impacted on men uh, like Jubal Howe, uh, impacted on men like William Keith, who went on to be very active uh, in the watchmaking industry in America that really created this large industrial watchmaking you know, machinery. And I think that their experience uh, in that shop, uh, their experience working with Luther Goddard in that shop had to have impacted on the way they looked at the ability to mass produce objects, whether those be watches, clocks, or anything else. And so we, we really need to give Luther Goddard a great deal of credit for having gone into those production, uh, that mass production of watches, and having that kind of plant those seeds uh, with men like Jubal Howe, with William Keith. And William Keith doesn't even deny that this was a factor. You know, he knows that it was a factor in his, in his, in his thinking. So, and then as we look at that, 
um, I think that's an, that, that demonstrates how important Luther Goddard is in in the consistency of looking at the American watch industry. Did he produce a lot of watches? Not really. Um, did he produce the best watches ever made? Eh, not really. But what he did was he came up with a system within his shop that could later be patterned and, and later be in, encouraged by men like William Keith and, and Jubal Howell and, and the watch industry in general later. So I tend to think that, that Luther Goddard's kind of contribution um, is fairly significant when it comes to the impact his shop, his small shop had on watch production in America, you know, a hundred years after he's gone. So what do we need to know though? Well, one of the things we're continuing to do and I'm, and I'm continuing to do is to photo document as many surviving Luther Goddard watches as possible. Um, ideally, I like to photograph them here uh, simply because we have the equipment to do the photography well, um, but I, I will take any photograph of any Luther Goddard watch I can get. Um, so that's the main thing is let's, let's document every surviving Luther Goddard watch. Let's, let's see where they are. Let's make sure we know what's happening to these watches, whether they're in public, public homes or private. Um, so that we can keep track of these pieces uh, as an important part of our American watchmaking tradition. Secondly, we really need to look at um, further study in the archives in Massachusetts to get a feel for Luther Goddard's operations. We need to look up apprenticeship contracts. We need to look up bills of sale. We need to know who his customers were, who his clients were, who his neighbors were, so that we can start to track down um, and understand more and more Luther Goddard's operation and what impact that operation may have had on future American watchmaking traditions. And so the best way to do that is to get into the archives in Shrewsbury and Worcester in, in Boston uh, and really look at those records and go through the microfilm and go through the original records and try to find out as much as we can about the shop, about Luther Goddard's operation, his property, and, and everything that was going on there. Uh, the other thing that is of particular interest to me is uh, who was this watch? Who was our number? Who was our number 462 made for? Because this was not made for someone who was just your average. You looked at some of those other watches. Some of them are very simple. Uh, this one was definitely not very simple. So who were these watches made for? And I'll, I'll show you an example of another watch uh, that might help illustrate that. It might help us out. I mentioned that I've received some emails uh, just since this webinar went public, uh, and two of them, uh, one of them, well, actually, I'll share with you uh, a couple of, of collections of watches. Uh, the first two you probably, you may be familiar with if you're familiar with Luther Goddard at all. Um, these are two watches uh, that were featured in uh, in uh, Chris Bailey's book on, 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 on American horology and watchmaking, um, and the title has just whoop, escaped right out of my brain but you all probably are familiar with the book. Uh, again, if you're looking at these watches, this is where we get into the numbering thing being an issue. We don't know what those numbers really mean. If that's the order in which they were made, um, it seems odd that number 293 would be as crude as it is um, that late in the, in, the, in the production run. But you'll notice again, L. Goddard and Son, and then just an L. Goddard. So this is, we don't always see consistency with these. The numbering system here, 194, 295, Still pretty balanced cocks, but nothing as decorative as what we've seen, and certainly not what we saw on one six or on four sixty two. If you see, you've got these various motifs that show up uh, on these that kind of get duplicated again on the balanced cocks, but again, nothing uh, to the to the condition of, of four sixty two. This watch, uh, though, uh, is a really interesting piece, and it tells us a little bit about uh, how. And, and, and who Luther Goddard was making these watches for. Again, we're seeing that, um, that very nice American Eagle motif on the balance cock, very well engraved, very decoratively engraved. Uh, this is a watch that was just sent to me not too long ago by a member. Um, you'll see the L Goddard again, with that L always confusing people sometimes. Shrewsbury, uh, you'll see, but what you see on this watch, which is very interesting, is uh, 4D Johnson, and then it says MS, which we think is Massachusetts. The best bet we have is that uh, there was a Revolutionary War veteran who served as a private and as an ensign uh, in, during the Revolutionary War uh, who lived in Worcester and Shrewsbury, and his name was David Johnson. Um, and it's likely that this watch was produced for him, uh, given that there's no reason to, the, the there's no reason for Luther Goddard. There weren't that many David Johnsons in Massachusetts in 18, 
uh, 09 or 1812 when this watch was produced for starters uh, after going through the uh, census searches for those years. Uh, and David Johnson shows up in the pension records as living right in Shrewsbury. So it's likely that's who this watch was for. Uh, again, showing that Luther Goddard has a, uh, a pattern maybe of making these watches uh, with this particular motif uh, for men who had served during the American Revolution, um, as opposed to the standard bounce cocks that you see on those other watches, which may have been made for, for customers who had not or simply couldn't afford to have this kind of work done. Uh, so this is an interesting, uh, again, this is kind of an interesting watch for, the, for helping us look at number 462 uh, and see uh, how that watch uh, was made and who it was made for. What's interesting is uh, in 1817, uh, Luther Goddard moves his uh, operation and his Goddard and Son moves to a place in Worcester, Mass. They build a, a, a couple of buildings in Worcester, Mass uh, on Main Street, and it's called ends up being called Goddard's Row. Uh, this is what it looks like uh, in the mid-19th century, uh, where you're looking at Goddard's Row and, and, and his shops would have been located in these buildings. Um, by uh, the 1950s and 60s, uh, Goddard Row was in this condition. Still not too bad, though. Still looking. Still businesses uh, abound there. Radio Shack. Everybody needs a Radio Shack. But today, unfortunately, this is Goddard's Row. Um, there are no buildings there anymore. Uh, the pictures you see, the first two pictures came from uh, a document that was put together in the 1970s and early 80s for the to help uh, save these buildings. Um, and unfortunately, the, the, they were not successful in, in saving these buildings and, and making sure that people understood, again, the significance of Luther Goddard, the significance and the role he played in the development of early American industry and manufacturing. So I think that's one of the other reasons why I have uh, kind of delved as much as I have into Luther Goddard and his operation is um, it's important that we not forget the work that Luther Goddard did, and it's important that we not understand uh, it's important that we understand how important Luther Goddard was uh, in the scheme of bridging that those two industrial revolutions in, in Britain and the United States and, and giving and kind of sowing the seeds uh, of mass production of watches in America. And I think that for that purpose alone, I think it's, uh, it's worth studying Luther Goddard more. Again, I, I'd like to thank um, our sponsor for this webinar, uh, Vortic Wash Company. Uh, they're based in Fort Collins, Colorado. Um, you can certainly go to their, their uh, website and check out some of their watches. Um, I actually own a Vortic watch. It's one of the few watches I've actually bought uh, on my own. Um, I don't typically buy anything anymore. Um, but I, I had to have one of these watches. They, they take orphaned pocket watch movements and they give them a new home right on your wrist. And it's, and it's really a neat, a neat practice. So again, thank you uh, to them as our sponsors. Um, I'd also like to throw out a couple other thanks. I'd like to thank Philip Ponitz. Um, uh, he's probably not listening, but that's okay. But I want to thank him. Um, I learned an awful lot about our particular watch by sitting down with Philip uh, for an afternoon. And so I want to thank him for that. Um, I'd like to thank Linda Davis, who's the curator at the Shrewsbury Historical Society. Uh, Linda has been incredibly generous and helpful in providing documents and, and, and information for me on Luther Goddard uh, when I ask her, and she's been sweet. They also provided us the, the actual painting image of, of Luther Goddard, which was wonderful to have. Um, and I'd also like to thank uh, those private collectors uh, who have provided images and information on their Luther Goddard watches that I was able to share with you tonight. Um, I think it's really uh, important um, that we all understand how important Luther Goddard is in the scheme of our, you know, of our American history of horology. And uh, I'm happy to take some questions uh, from you guys now. So actually, no, we do not have any questions this evening. Oh, awesome. Uh, oh, I take that back. One sneaked in at the very last minute from George. What made Goddard stop producing watches and what did he do in his later years? Uh, Luke, what, what basically made Goddard stop producing watches was the need to produce watches went away. That's the main thing. Uh, the War of 1812 ended uh, in 1815. Uh, there was no need for, for watch production to go on anymore. You could once again import your watches from Great Britain at a cheaper price than Luther Goddard could produce them in his shop. Uh, the other thing that happened with Luther Goddard uh, was that he decided to go full time into preaching and being a minister in the Baptist church. And that was really how he ended his life was principally as a, as a minister and, uh, and active in the Baptist church in Massachusetts. So it was a combination of those two things. Daniel Goddard and Parley Goddard continued to repair watches. 
and you will occasionally see a watch with Parley Goddard's signature on it, uh, but it's typically an English watch that he just simply put his name on. Uh, so the, the Goddard sons continue to do silversmithing and watchmaking and repair, but certainly not uh, in the scale that Luther Goddard was doing. And then another a question from Joe came in. It said, 462 seems to have a name scratched into the back of the watch. Has any research been done on this? And if it is, what is that name? Uh, we haven't been able to make out what that name is yet. So um, what we're hoping to do is is do a different photography of that. Um, I've been talking to some uh, professor at the Millersville University who can do a, a special kind of photography with, with the silver, which will bring those lines out a little clearer for us, but we haven't been able to make them out yet. All right, then we have a question from from Robert came in. Are cases always eagle hallmarked on the inner and outer cases? No, not always. Sorry, <laughs> it's, it's a short answer. No, um, typically not. No, the, the, the two cases um, in this case were not. The inner case was hallmarked, the outer case was not. Um, if it had been an English case, we, we know there would have been hallmarks, uh, well, well known hallmarks on the cases. So there was, there was other evidence for why we lean towards an American manufacturer of that case. <laughs> then say say so our final question tonight is from Rich it said are you going to publish an article on your research into <laughs> Goddard uh, I would love to publish an article on my research into Goddard unfortunately for me I feel like that research is still ongoing um, I, every time I f see another Luther Goddard watch I find another rabbit hole to go down and and I hate the idea of, of putting an article out there until I'm completely 100% happy with what I would be writing. But ultimately, short answer is yes. But I, I would much rather see us put together um, a, a larger monograph that looks at a number of early American watchmakers and their influence, because I think that would be more um, more valuable, more interesting to, to the field um, than simply a, a one examination of Luther Goddard. But I think there are other early American watchmakers that, that we should also be looking at as well. All right. Well, I want to thank you, Noel, and thank you to everyone for attending this webinar. Once you leave tonight's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation, and we would appreciate if you would complete that and provide your feedback. You will also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to review a recording of the webinar. Remember, remember the program committee has organized these monthly webinars and all of the earlier presentations are recorded and available for viewing. Be sure to check out the complete listing and also have advanced notice of upcoming web webinars at our website, www.nawcc.org. On behalf of the NAWCC and our presenter, thank you for joining us and have a great evening.